Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan, and I am the marketing manager at Data Science Dojo, and I have Tom Ives and Gates Sankari with me. Uh, Tom is the lead data scientist at UL Prospector, and Gate is the digital health platform advisor at Bear. And they're going to be presenting automating supervised machine learning pipelines a little bit at a time. So Tom and Gaith, why don't you go ahead and get started? Great. And I should qualify. I am no longer with UL, but I appreciate that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm even more proud of being founder of integrated machine learning and AI. That's, that's a much more important role. Got it. I'll update your bio. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for that. That was my mistake. We planned this quite a while ago. Well, guys, we're really honored to be here. In case you can't tell, Gaith and I are brothers. We were separated at birth, so we ended up being raised differently. But seriously, we're very close friends. We love to present together, and we're even writing a book together on this material. And we hope this talk will help you. In our experience, there's a lot of smart people in data science, and when they are exposed to this material, many of them have an attitude of like, oh, finally, seeing it all as one cohesive set of methodologies. And we hope you have that reaction too. I wanna to read this out loud to you because um, I think it's a powerful bit of wisdom that we can use in many areas of our lives. I've encountered many great mentors in many forms. One powerfully recurring principle taught by all of them, the greatest practitioners in any field take the time to master the basics. The basics are the foundation of any great art in life. Masters literally practice the basic ten, basics tens of thousands of times. And Gaith and I are all for the latest cool tools and techniques, but they will crumble as a house with a poor foundation if they're not built on good basics, fundamentals. So this is what we're going to talk about. And I hope this looks a little overwhelming. If, well, I don't hope it looks overwhelming, but I suspect for many of you, it might look overwhelming. But we're going to break it down piece by piece. And really, this is just trying to get the best data so that we can do good predictions. And we liken it to picking fruit. Uh, we want to pick really good fruit so we can eat healthy fruit and we wanna throw away the bad fruit. Same thing with data. Well, that was a fancy long transition. Sorry for that. Yeah, why don't you take over from here? Okay, so let's first, before going to the, what is the pipeline? Uh, first, I have to thank Tom for, for this uh, introduction and about our brotherhood, let's name it. Um, Second point, it's about the pipeline. What is the pipeline in general? Let's name it or let's consider it as assembly line. And since we are looking for a production, this is the target of our uh, speech today. It's to think how to push our machine learning models into production. What kind of activities needed to do that and how to support the usage and get the benefit from this huge boom of machine learning during the last years into production, into real life of the people, into main business, into real scenarios. Now, the difference between the machine learning experience in general or experiment in general, and what we are looking for, it's to have the assembly line. And we have um, a, an example we are always using, analogy we are always using that even if the uh, automobile or the cars are or invented by Karl Benz uh, at the end uh, of uh, 19th century, but the real boom of, the, of, of automobile uh, industry, it's appeared with Henry Ford when he created the assembly line for, for, uh, for these machines. Now, according to that, we can consider what Carl Benz is doing. It's the pure knowledge. It's the vertical growth of this field. And what Henry Ford performed, it's the horizontal growth. Our speech today, it's just to focus on the, not only, but it's how to focus on the horizontal growth to get the best benefit from uh, machine learning techniques. So, um, we have in the, our pipeline, we have, we are always dealing, let's, just to try to explain the basics, what we mean by features. 
features are the input to our model, are the information, the data, the pieces of data that we are using to create a prediction or analytic model in general. This is, can be performed on data science model or in machine learning model at the end. So what we name it a feature, it's at the end, it's the input. And the input, it has a three major, let's say, um, properties, which is first, it is samples from the overall population because it's not possible to have the whole population in, in one model, in one model process or in one pipeline. Um, so second, it's always we have to use what kind of inputs that really has prediction or predicting values, which is reduced to the essentials because any correlation, any relationship between the inputs, it might lead to a mistake or to be uh, bias in the, in the output. And the, we will explain how this is appeared later. And sometimes performing some kind of engineering uh, for this input, it will be needed because this engineering will help the mathematical machine, the math machines that we are running, which is the model that we are building to, uh, to perform in, in a better way. Now, this is about the feature in general. What is the output of our model? It's what we name it labels. Uh, labels, it's what is we are expecting. And according to that, when we are talking about supervised machine learning, the labels, it's, uh, the labels in our data set, in our first training data set, it will be provided. We have to find these labels. We have to perform sometimes kind of engineering for these labels because this is will tell the model what to expect and what kind of relationship uh, exists between these labels and the features that we are using or the inputs. What is the model? The model is, uh, uh, or, uh, the model, it's our math machine and there is multiple way to find the model and we have to find a methodology to compare the models together. And for sure, all of this has to be performed under the human overwatch because always there is some, this, let's say, some bias or some drifts might be discoverable or sometimes it might be hidden and it will be uh, discovered over the, the, in the production life. So this is our uh, highest level of thinking about the pipeline. So what is the pipeline? It's set of processes performed over the inputs to find the outputs using a models or math machines, let's name it right now, and under the overwatch of the engineers or the machine learning or data scientists in our scenario. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so this graph, Tom, if you want to explain about it, I think it will be your vision. It will yeah. be more clear from mine, yes. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll take this one. So we just wanted to give you a, the highest level view of what happens when we're getting a model ready to make predictions. So we have our inputs and we run it through the model, and let's call it a math machine. And it makes some predictions, and the very first ones are bad, because it's just using some random factors, some random parameters for the model. We can call them weights. And so then we take those predictions and compare them to our known outputs, like I said, and we get an error. And we use that error to change the weights in the model and make yet another next iteration prediction. And we keep repeating this into the, until the error gets to as small as possible. And one thing we like to say about this is all machine learning problems are math problems. So to get the data ready for this kind of model training can take a lot of work, with, especially with real world data. So here, just maybe I, I want to add something. When we are talking about the previous uh, chart that we are saying, this one, it's this is how we build our model. But again, when we are talking about the supervised machine learning pipeline, we are talking about how to build the model and how to make the full pipeline, the full assembly, assembly line ready for production, to be used in production, and that including some other activities. We might discuss it during the session. At the end, we are looking at this pipeline on the high level. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the features, it's the data, it's our input, it's what's driving our, our model performance, but what kind of 
action it's needed to be ready, which kind of data we are able to use. This is um, decided by our data preparation pipeline, let's name it. This data preparation pipeline, it's starting from processing the, let's say the high level of it, it's considered the missing values, processing the missing values, clean the data, uh, encoding text, because at the end, let's remember what we said in the, in the previous slide that all the machine learning problems are mathematical problems and text has to be represented in a mathematical friendly way, let's name it. So encoding the text and we have multiple methods to do that. Then we have to normalize this input to be uh, controlled in a better way to be on the range needed. Uh, then we have to reduce the dimensionality. Let's let, let's discuss about this later because once we start with this uh, with this concept, it, we cannot stop and perform some kind of engineering to this uh, to these features. At that point, we can consider that our data is ready to be fed into the, the the model and train the model according to that. That means training the model. It's one step, one iterative step. step it has a lot of parameters to be controlled, but it's one step. All of these steps, it's before that. And also we have other steps after that. So that's why we used to, to say that 80% or more than 80% of the machine learning uh, uh, model building, let's say, it's considered as data preparation. But while the model training itself or the model itself, it will, it will be only 20% of the work. Uh, let's say it in that way. So anything, Tom, to add here? And also, I think it's good to uh, to check about the questions, maybe uh, for the previous part, just to keep it synchronized quickly. Yeah, no questions are coming in yet. But basically, in summary, our features require much attention and sometimes even our labels. And some of that attention we have to give is to missing values. And this is a good chart from Medium that we stole um, because it's a good chart. So to us, missing values are a travesty. We hate them. And sometimes they're so bad that we find we have to either delete rows, uh, delete complete columns, which would typically be a feature, or there's a pairwise deletion. We would only do this pairwise deletion, meaning, <clears throat> when we're comparing two columns, a pair of columns, when we're looking for co correlation coefficients between features. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But our preferred way to deal with missing values is to impute what they most likely were. And depending on whether we have a categorical or a continuous problem, there's different methods for predicting. Sometimes the mean or the median or the mode are okay, to use for replacement, but more oftentimes we'll predict the values that are missing. <clears throat> and that actually ends up working pretty good. Time series has its own special considerations when we do that. Then we also have to clean the data because just because it's missing doesn't mean, I mean, just because we replace the missing ones doesn't mean we're out of the woods or that there's no more problems. We can have things like uh, too much data, meaning too many features. We can have outliers that we need to go study or inconsistencies. We can see strange patterns, et cetera. So we wanna diagnose these um, and figure out what, how we wanna deal with them. And if you remove outliers, the main thing is to go study them and um, <clears throat> document why you remove them because those outliers can tell you a great story sometimes or a horrible story that you need to understand and deal with. But the main thing, uh, a, a lot of what we encounter is perhaps someone uh, didn't program the data entry system correctly and a, num a value that should be a float or an integer is being entered as a string. Maybe a date wasn't formatted correctly. These are all things we can automate uh, the, the cleaning of. Exactly, Tom. So, this, is, this is a huge point that you make it at the end, which is uh, when we have, 
let's say, a clear understanding about how the data is collected, we can check our, uh, our routines, our mechanisms of data cleansing to select what's suitable from them. So right now we are, we are mentioning here a new terminology, which is the, the mechanism. Mechanism, it's any kind of function or procedure or any routine that you build to perform a specific task, but we have to reform it in a generalized way that will help us to use it later. This is the major step and the basic step for automation. So and how we can, Nilu yes. Oh, sorry. Nilu's asking a good question. Is the removing of missing values a data cleaning process? Sort of. If we're going through making sure we get a value in place of the fields that have missing values, sure, we could call that cleaning, but we usually call it a special type of uh, problem just where we're dealing with missing values. Guy, go on. Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, I'm no going to interrupt as well. We have a question on YouTube um, from Shyam. Uh, what are the ways for handling new categories that appear after some time when our model pipeline is in production? Ah. Okay, that's great, that's but it, 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 it will come next. Okay. Will you, pro will you remind us to answer that later in the presentation? That's a great question. For sure. Yes, exactly. Let's uh, go now, on to the next. Oh, go on ahead. Go just ahead. I, I have one point related to the missing values. Just we need to mention that that our labels, our given labels, since, since we are talking about supervised learning, about given labels that we have on our training or our data set, our, our labels, it will help us to predict the missing value sometimes when we are using, uh, when we have a categorical, for example, uh, missing values and we need to, to make the imputation. So the, the label itself, it's part of our data set at the end. We know that it's our label, but it can be helped even in the processing the missing value. And um, honestly, and it, honestly, it, it's blame major rule here sometimes. Um, great. Okay. Great point. That, I, I think I think Tom, the encoding, it's uh, it's your game. Okay, I'll go on ahead with that one. Okay. In case y'all can't tell, we kind of switch it up each time we present on who's going to do which slide, but. Okay, like we said early on, sometimes we have data that comes in the form of text, but we need numbers because all machine learning problems are math problems. So here's one way we do it. It's called one hot encoding. In other words, we wanna take each of these words and encode them to a value. But when we have this type of categorical data, such as these colors, we create completely new features for each color. And then if that color appears, it's a one. If it doesn't, it's a zero for that column, but the one that did appear gets the one. And because the case in this example where green occurs, red and blue will be zero, we want to remove one of the columns. So if we have N categories, we're gonna end up with N minus one because that last one or the first one or whichever one you remove is described by all the other cases being zero. <clears throat> and just to make it a, a long story short, it just makes the math cleaner. It creates fewer problems in, in the math, in the solving for the models. Now the other form can be ordinal where, oh, it's clear we had some kind of scale of quality or goodness indicated uh, by the words. So in this case, bad is zero, et cetera, excellent is four. So that's ordinal encoding. Now we can get fancier and fancier and um, natural language processing deals with a lot of very intricate, uh, beautiful, powerful encoding schemes. Thank God. <laughs> but, for this one, let's say we had a corpus of documents and we record all the words that occur in all those documents. And we get a vocabulary for the corpus. Then we say each word has a number. Now we go back through each of the documents and we say, well, how many times did word zero occur in doc zero? 
And how many times did word one occur in doc zero? So we're getting an occurrence rate for each of the words. And then we do the same for the next doc and the next doc. This ends up being a very sparse, gigantic matrix, depending on the size of your corpus and vocabulary. But thanks to SciPy and its sparse matrix routines, you can take a huge matrix and find out uh, close matches of one document to another, our new document coming in, closely matching one of these other ones in, in less than a second, even for very large matrices. So these are just some examples of how we encode words to uh, numbers. Uh, then just the just miss, thing, uh, maybe, Tom, sorry for interruption. Just to, one question, it's always coming to, to the mind of, of uh, data scientists, when to use, um, for example, one hot encoding and when to go to the ordinal uh, encoding. Yes. Um, you, beside, beside, I, I will add this. You already make it clear that it's depending on the nature of the values itself, that 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 input itself. Beside that, sometimes even if it's categorical information, just like the colors here, or classific, it can be classified easily. But the size of this matrix, it can be very huge. Now, yes. at that point, it might be wise to go to the ordinal, not following one hot encoding, because um, it will be easier to, re to, to be represented uh, for point. Practic practical point. Yes. Yeah, so this is what fact, I want to add here. We always want to reduce the dimensionality of our data set if we can. So if possible, use ordinal encoding, which is a one-to-one -one replacement versus one hot encoding, which means for the number of different words we had, we had to come up with that many new features. So that's an excellent point, Guyth. And we're, just so you know, a lot of the reason we're talking through all these principles is we, we use them to help make our data set as small as practically possible. Now, the next thing we're going into is normalizing our feature set. And Guyth, do you want to talk on this or you want me to do it? No, no, please go ahead. I, I will, I will comment. I will, I will go for the reduce. Okay. Excellent. So, what's important about scaling is it gets all our numerical ranges within the same, uh, an equal range, so that the, we don't have one feature being a much larger magnitude than another, and this helps us in the toward later when we're doing the modeling because. Some of the types of models we use give weights on the features. They tell which feature is more important than another to the predictions, but we can't rely on those weights unless the features are scaled within similar ranges. So this is really important for that reason and other reasons, uh, numerically speaking. Okay, now Guy's gonna talk about okay. reducing that our reducing model to make it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, uh, this uh, image is here. Yes, exactly explain our situation as data scientists. We are always looking for reducing the dimensionality. But what is the dimensionality itself? What, what this terminology means here? Let's consider a line uh, equation, which is, for example, or, or a circle equation, which is only uh, we have it as two dimensions, X and Y and everything related to that in our case. Now, if you want to explain what is our dimensions, what is the dimension that we are falling in, in our data set, you can consider that number of your inputs, the number of your features, it's the dimensionality that we have. And according to that, we are talking about space with many, many, many dimensions. Now, uh, whenever we are able to reduce the dimension, it will give us more clarity about how the model it will be performed and how where is the gap, if there is any gap. Um, I used to have uh, a translated um, statement about that. Whenever the dimensionality is higher, the statement about your model is less. You cannot say a lot about it. And this is the scenario we are facing it in, in, in deep learning, for example, but this is totally not different, but yes, it has its own management methods. So how to reduce the dimensionality? It's 
why it's bad. First, uh, I will I will I will follow the the slide. Um, uh, redundancy on, on the individual effects and accuracy on the model weights. Let's consider that, for example, we have two inputs that having the same rule toward the output. So what does that mean? It's for us, we can consider them at, as one, one input. That means one of them, it can be, um, can be removed because they are collinear to each other. That means we, we need a non-collinear inputs to be used in our production model. Why? Because the collinear model, just like the, 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 the uh, let's say the chart on the right, the collinear features, it's performing the same toward the output. And that means we are giving this feature a higher value. Let's, let's en Englishize it let, like this, a higher value than other features. Now, According to that, once we have this collinearity, it's very wise to consider removing one of them. And there is a specific method about it. Um, let's say how to do that. We have multiple methods. Once let's consider the correlation matrix, which is explaining how the relationship between each feature and other. And uh, we have, uh, let's say uh, other methods, let's, uh, What's the solution? Also, we can discuss about the solution later, but let's go to the mechanisms that we are using uh, for remo removing or reducing the dimensionality. So we have, um, Tom, if you want to go on that. Um, yeah, th about this, uh, we, we, we're constantly trying to improve this slide set and this one sometimes confuses <laughs> yes. even those that have used it many times, but basically going back to our initial mind map, We're trying to reduce our data set. Why? Well, because it might have collinearity. We just covered that. So we, we don't need two features playing the same role. It'd be like two guys on a soccer team trying to play the same position. Well, what happens to the empty position? Or it's, it's just better to have one feature serving each task. So we keep the strongest of those collinear ones, like Guy said. But... Um, At the same time, we want strong correlation between the label and the features. So what are our methods for that? Well, we can loop through the features and see which one gives the greatest accuracy for the model just when we can use one feature. And then we eliminate that from our list and we go back and look for the second most important one. And then the third most important one. And then we can do that in reverse too. So that's a very strong method after we've gotten rid of co collinear features or even before to see, well, which features are most important. And um, if you don't get rid of the collinear features, that can confuse that analysis. Um, let's see. We just want to show you what it means to be correlated. So this would be perfect positive correlation. This would be perfect negative correlation with everything in between where you can see There's not even a clear correlation at this point. Now, negative doesn't mean bad. It just means that it's saying uh, this particular feature is tending to reduce the value of the label. And there's different ways to calculate these correlations. But then these other method, we talked about looping lasso, which is a penalization method used in linear regression. Uh, can help you figure out when you're using lasso, it will drive those features that aren't as important down to zero while you train a linear regression model. And then um, finally, there's, uh, oh, and while we're doing these methods, we're always using metrics on the models. We're looking not just for accuracy, but how well we generalize, meaning Oh, it trained well on the training set, but how well will it do with new data? And we have techniques to do that, to test that with our training data. But always this fancy word parsimony, um, this American acronym that's been around for my whole lifetime, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. We're just trying to keep, we're looking for the set of features that are essential. We don't want too many, we don't want too few. And then there's a soft method that we call 
principle component analysis. And if you are familiar with uh, eigenspace, eigenvectors, eigenvalues, this is what this is. And we love this going into this space when we need to, because if you have a lot of collinearity that's hard to get rid of, it will be decoupled in PCA. However, we're always trying to explain what's going on. And it's not that once you move to that new space, to the eigen space, that special space where all the features are decoupled, it's got some great tools to tell you which features you can drop and such, but don't get sucked into thinking that that means it changes the features in your original space. Oh no, it doesn't. What it, but if you use the eigenvectors, it can help you to describe the relation between the eigenspace features and the original space features. And uh, you guys want to connect and or follow Jonathan Papworth, my son, Guy's brother. He can explain very clearly how to do that visualization relation between the two spaces. Guy, what would you add here? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, maybe a couple of things. The first one, it's related to um, to the correlation, yes, collinearity, we, are, we want to get rid of it, but sometimes we have to make it in a careful way because we sometimes need to use a two collinear features because we cannot get rid of them. Uh, one example that we can speak about it, which is the, the negative, uh, let's say, correlation metrics that we found it in, 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 the, in the previous slide, Sometimes because the correlation is, neg is negative and for the nature of our task, we need to keep the both features. That means even if they are correlated, unless we find, um, let's say maybe third feature or another thing to tell us. I will give one example. Um, if you are predicting anything related to, that, to your health and you are using a cholesterol information, there is always a correlation between uh, the uh, low density cholesterol and high density cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, but you cannot remove one of them because each one of them is playing different role to your prediction. This is the first point. The second point, it's related to the BCA. Also, we have to be careful about the nature of our task because sometimes BCA, it cannot be a good mechanism to follow, especially mainly I face that in my personal life uh, in uh, unsupervised learning task when it's related to the clustering task because BCA is moving from one space to another. So even if we understand the contribution of each original feature to the uh, eigen feature or, feature or BCA feature, it will not be enough to understand how the cluster is created on the BCA feature. So sometimes we have to be careful not to continue the modeling with the BCA feature, just to use it as a decision making for if we have if we are able to remove some uh, some features or some inputs or not. So this is, um, let's say, practical example about about what we what we are talking about. This is an excellent point guys making. And um, actually, there's sometimes you have collinearity and you don't want to get rid of it. That way you could go to PCA or you can use one of the modeling algorithms that's not sensitive to collinearity. So we should point that out too. Just depending on the nature of what you need to communicate from your work to your organizations, that will dictate whether you leave collinearity in because it doesn't affect clustering and we want to see perhaps the relation of those. Um, a similar thing happens in diamond analysis where there's different measurements and they all closely correlate to carrot size, but you may want to keep all those features in as a description of the model, then you can go to PCA. Or if you're using another algorithm, you don't even need to worry about the collinearity as much. Okay, N um, next. Just maybe before the engineering, let's check that question. I think there's a question coming from YouTube. Nathan, if you are, help, if you are able to help us with that. Yeah, I have a couple. Um, yep. So the first is, how about if we do not have ordinality in our feature and hard to do one hot encoding because of reducing dimensionality. Let's say we have 1000 different categories for a feature. And I posted these in the chat in case you want to read them. 
Yeah, it's not to say that, okay, uh, how, to, how to answer this briefly. There's, remember, this becomes very binary at this point. And if you have a lot of one hot encoded features, you're gonna have big areas of your feature set that are zeros and ones. In that case, for the features that were originally numerical, I would choose to scale them from zero to one. That's usually min-max scaling. But just because your data set gets really large due to one hot encoding, doesn't mean it's gonna be a horrible problem. For example, most of the scikit-learn algorithms will accept sparse matrices, and it makes a huge difference in your training speed. So again, it's a goal to reduce the number of features, but it doesn't mean shy away from using, you know, a thousand one hot encoded features if you need to. Just you now you're being careful to look for other methods to deal with that rapidly. And then this next question from YouTube, what about correcting a correlated feature for its correlation as is commonly done by Wall Street with the US stock market and the price of Boeing stock. Um, now I'm not sure what you mean correcting a correlated feature for its correlation. Do you mean when there's collinearity? Um, do, do a follow-up question for that and then we'll move on and look again. Um, so now once we have this data set reduced, um, and by the way, Sometimes you want to engineer and then reduce. Sometimes you want to reduce and then engineer. It just kind of depends. But typically I found you're safe to reduce first and then add engineered features. What do we mean by engineered features? Guy, do you want to take this one or? Go ahead, please. Oh, sir. So I'm, I'm just, just uh, there is one point it's coming. Sorry for interruption before starting the, about the engineering. Also, we didn't highlight somehow uh, clearly why we need to reduce the correlation or the, uh, the dimensionality. There is a clear two reasons, which is very famous. And there is also other practical reasons. The first one is raising the explainability of your model. Once you have, um, let's say, controlled number and the suitable number, the best number of, of inputs, uh, explaining the model, it will be easier. The yes. second one, it's the cost. At the end, when with the higher dimensionality, that means you are going to use more resources and this is, can be more and more in a very dramatic way, which is, it can be finished on the deep learning scenarios, which is, we are not running away from it, but at the end, once you have possibility to make it simpler, it's most, faster, cost-effective, and easier to explain. And uh, to uh, Kareem's question on the Q&A, is it a rule of thumb to avoid features that have some sort of dependency on each other? It's more than a rule of thumb. Depending on your modeling algorithm, it can create um, very bad numerical issues, singularity in your matrices, uh, you know, underdetermined matrices, et cetera. So, um, then you ask, somehow combine features as preferred method to reduce? Possibly. Again, it depends on the feature. So it, it could be that you're replacing, you, you, I can imagine situations where you've got collinear features and a combination of those can be the replacement of the, the collinear ones. And that kind of takes us well to this engineered example it could be that we engineer a feature to replace those collinear features. Have never thought of answering this area that way. And then Jonathan, my son, he's saying outliers are often removed. Can you share some good examples where outliers would be welcome to train a model? Um, yes, I'll come to that in a minute, Jonathan, make sure we answer it. Okay, so here's an example where I have feature X, and labels Y. 
And so this is a scatter plot between the two. This is some simple univariate problem. But we see that if I'm looking for a linear relationship between these two, I don't get it. But if I engineer a feature and then fit the model, oh, it does so much better. And frankly, if I had plotted x squared here, this would have looked linear. And I should have done that. We'll, we'll update the presentation with that. Um, oh, Mustafa, great question. Having a collinearity, how to prove the causality? It's not that you prove the causality, but let's say, how do you find out that you have collinearity? You look at that uh, matrix of correlation values. And what you're doing is you're saying, how does feature A correlate to feature B, to feature C, to feature, et cetera. That way, when you have high correlation numbers between the features, that's bad. When you have high correlation between a feature, any of the features in the label, that's good. So, but how do you prove the causality? Um, you'd have to get into the, each specific domain for that and ask, okay, does one cause the other or do they just relate intrinsically? It's more like that. Okay. Oh, and Jonathan, I thought of a good way to at least give an initial answer to your question. Um, if you know those outliers are gonna fly in through your pipeline when you're using the model in production, it'd be great to leave something in place like either a scaling mechanism or a uh, generalization routine like lasso or ridge that helps to reduce those. But it also could be that you've trained a deep neural network and it, it somehow learned to deal with those very well. All right, so this is just very simple feature engineering. You can get very complicated with it and engineer a lot of additional features. Now, some of you that may know more, and Guy, please jump in any point here. Uh -huh. Some of you may be thinking, well, deep neural networks are good at figuring out their own feature engineering. Yes, but what our point is, we still wanna, even though we still wanna reduce, and yes, deep neural networks can figure out what features aren't important. Again, it's the training, the parsimony, the simplicity of the model, every bit of handwork that we can automate to reduce the dimensionality up front before we go to test deep neural networks or deep learning can help us in the deep learning too. Guy, what would you add there? Yes, actually I want to describe the deep learning it just filling the glass of water from the waterfall. That mean you are using a lot of data with a huge structure to perform one task. At the end, you are sure this task will be performed, but the wasted resources, it will be high. So even with deep, uh, deep uh, neural networks, with deep learning scenarios, and yes, it's, uh, it's help us to find it by its own, let's say, methodology, it will find the suitable features to use. But at the end, currently we are in the, in the in the age, let's say, on the in the place where we are looking even to simplify the training methodology of the deep neural networks. For example, just like the sparse brain papers, if anybody from you just check about it, which is creating a kind of mask of zeros for some uh, some new uh, some neurons uh, and and hidden layers, for example, just to check uh, if it's enough that to reduce the size of the neural networks. And this is, will help them to run multiple experiments with the same resources. So somehow, somehow, even with the deep neural networks, we are running from, the, from that a huge cost to reduce the size of the neural networks and the time of the, of the training needed. So yes, always reducing and engineering the features, it will be helpful even with the uh, deep learning scenarios. Exactly. So as you've seen, uh, we say 80%, it's probably higher, right, guys? 
Yes. The, the amount of work we need to put in on the features. And this doesn't count uh, all the code we're trying to refactor and make better and, and everything else. Now, labels. Do we ever engineer the labels? You bet we do. Sometimes that simplifies the whole problem. Some, do we ever scale the labels? Well, I've never seen it, but we always want to remain open and explore uh, when we're doing this. And again, it's because we're, we're trying to get the best fruit. Now, just so we have plenty of time for Q&A, Gaith and I are going to rush through the rest of this. These are the different types of models we have. In machine learning, we have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And in supervised learning, we can have classification problems or regression problems or continuous. And then in the unsupervised learning, it's stuff like clustering, understanding groupings. But there's even a higher branch up here called reinforced learning. And then, uh, boy, I guess <laughs> um, transformers appear in both. Uh, they, they can simultaneously appear in unsupervised and supervised. But how do we train these supervised models? And well, we randomly shuffle our data and then we split it mostly into a training group, the rest into a test group. And we prefer to do that in what's called K-fold cross-validation. We'll explain that on the next slide, but we're also exploring hyperparameters that are specific to each modeling algorithm. But as we try different algorithms and different hyperparameters, we have to have a way to measure the difference. So we have these metrics. And again, we're looking for generalization. Yeah, it works on cur current samples, but how can we get a guess of how it'll deal on future samples of data and then improve on growing data? And then we've got to change the model as needed. And this gets back to that question that was asked earlier. What about correct, uh, excuse me, uh, about the new category might be appeared yes, the, the categorical is. data. Yes, I, <coughs> sorry. I would like to Go answer this. And uh, once we train the model and then it's in the production, we are always keep tracking the model performance to detect two kind of, let's say, issues might appear. Um, first, the data drift and second, the concept drift. Now, a new category might appear. This is considered a data, data drift. And in this case, it might be suitable to rebuild your data set and retrain the model. Maybe the same model, that means the same algorithm can be followed. And concept drift, that means it's totally, there is change on the meaning of the input itself. That means something was um, describing the height or the distance between two cities and currently it's changed totally. There is different change different meaning to that uh, to that input which is it might appear in, in in the real life so at that point we have to run the full pipeline once again starting from building the data set from engineering the data everything has to be performed once again according to the new uh, issue um, identification let's name it like this so this is just to answer the category the category new category might appear because always in the production, we are keep monitoring for one of these two kind of issues might appear in the, uh, in the model performance. And another good thing to point out, this, we were really glad you asked that question because it deals with concept drift, but data drift can be actually tracked by seeing, hey, am I approaching the central limit theorem? And so you use tools to see is my overall distribution of my sample means approaching some steady state shape? That can help too. So in this whole process though, with these metrics, we're driving again toward parsimony. And we have a motivation to automate all of this. That is the training and the metrics and the choice of algorithm. Okay. Now, this is what cross-fold validation is. And let me just say it in the simplest way we figured out to say it. We want each portion of the data to get an opportunity to be the testing data. So you see, each time, we're, we're really just changing what group of data is going to be used for testing and the rest of it's used for training. But by going across the folds, what are we looking for? Yes, we want good accuracy on each fold, 
but we also want a tight distribution of accuracies. That tells us the model is generalizing well, at least as well as we can do with the current data we have for new data that would come in. And then always we're doing human oversight. This is why I jumped to this slide while Guy was giving his excellent explanation of we have to monitor models that are in production or that are being used to see is their concept drift, is their data drift, is there a different model that we could put in production that would do better based on our current data assets. Well, after going through all that, oh, by the way, always visualize. That's why this histograms is here. Across all of this work, we're always visualizing everything we can. And we hope this doesn't look so overwhelming anymore. And quite frankly, this doesn't tell the whole story. It's just kind of like a first layer overview of everything. And uh, we'll leave it on this slide and take questions now, or more questions. Thanks for the questions. Just maybe one thing I want, I want to mention here, why this brief explanation? Because once you are in, uh, all of us, when we are in, in production life for machine learning and we face some tools, orchestrators or something like that, what it's performing, it's helping us to automate what's possible to be automated and building our workflow, our pipeline to perform our task. So at the end, this is the concept. This is the basic that we are looking for. And then any other tool, we are trying to make it tool agnostic. Any other, any tool can help us to perform that. We know exactly where we started. Exactly. And by the way, think of the advanced, I mean, Henry Ford was brilliant when he applied assembly lines to making automobiles. But think of the improvements in manufacturing that have been brought to us by quality engineers with their Lean Six Sigma and their, their black belt analysis. And I could go on and on, but the, the cool things that they do, Dyke and I are rigorously over the next few years planning to take every bit of wisdom in those processes, abstract them and help find ways to improve this horizontal genius in creating pipelines. And oh, another thing we're trying to remind each other to say when we get great opportunities to talk to smart people like you guys is this, that 80% or more of the work that we're doing before we get to training the model, we want to get better as a whole, as a community, communicating the insights we're gaining from that back to our business stakeholders, our organizational stakeholders, our domain experts, because we feel that 80% of the insights come from 80% of that work. We can react, to, we can proact to those things, whereas when we get a model prediction, it's just at the reaction stage. So it's not to say the predictions aren't important, it's to say that all the stuff we showed you here on the right is huge and important. And for example, you're finding missing values, go find where the data is being entered and make sure that can't happen anymore. You find the source of the dirty data, go find a way to make sure that type of data dirt doesn't keep happening. The encoding, once you know how you need to encode something, go ahead and automate that outside your machine learning work. Normalization, if um, it's a thing. Um, since we are talking about that, I think it's good to, to check this question from YouTube. Uh, Nathan posted yes. on the chat. Can you talk about some of the models retraining approach and the production? Ah, you want to do it or me? You go. You can start. I'll start. <laughs> yes. So this is the point. This is probably a big point we may not have made very clear. The mechanisms of code that we've developed and it's automated, well, we're building an automation to test different models outside of production, that's different than the actual pipeline. Imagine that this set of code we've created has a bunch of uh, dials or, or settings we can change, what scaling mechanisms we use, what encoding we're using, uh, which features we're removing, what dirty data we're cleaning, all of that. Well, 
we have a lot of different things we can try outside of production, but we're putting a fixed version of the pipeline into production. It's outside of the production that we're constantly looking for new alternatives. I hope that helped. Guy, how would you explain it further? And, and on the other hand, we have to consider that we are explaining here the first two levels of overall pipeline that we are looking for, which is data preparation and modeling. There is third level, it's related to the rollout, which is here supported, hugely supported by software engineering concepts and the modern software engineering, um, let's say life cycle. Uh, concept like uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, tracking, uh, even if we go to the architecture part, which is um, go for example, for uh, microservices and then back from microservices, sometimes you are unable to share your data. The data privacy, it's very high and you have to follow some learning methodologies, just like uh, learning at the edge, for example, for autonomous cars or something. I can say that part, which is the third part, the rollout of the model, it will help you to always retrain once the model in the production first. Second, there is no model will be valid forever. All the models has to be retrained, but it's our task to define how to retrain it and which level of retraining we are, uh, we are following, a level of automation we are uh, looking for. We can choose to go manually and to decide what is the drop down, the drop time for us until we push the second model and the policies here, project management concept, and the most important application lifecycle concepts, it will help us define exactly which action needed at which stage. Yes, yes. And so, by the way, someone out there may be thinking, uh, what about AutoML? AutoML is awesome. We're actually teaching you the beginnings, not all, of how to approach that making your own AutoML. But AutoML doesn't necessarily do feature selection or feature engineering. It, it could, you could add it, but you also need to be agile to change for weirder problems. We're showing you, again, this is about mastering the basics for basic, typical machine learning. But a lot of the things we work on can get kind of weird. And the better you know these basics, the better you'll do in those weird situations. Let's see some more questions. I think there's no more questions. And I think we have think, to back to Nathan. <laughs> yeah, I think we're oh. a little over time here. So I'm going to cut us off. So uh, for th that. <laughs> thank you, Tom and Gaith. You guys are great. Um, it was great having you and your presentation was amazing. And thank you to everyone who joined. Um, I think you all learned a lot based on the questions that you were all asking. Um, I have one last thing to say. So uh, next week, November 3rd at noon, so the same time as today, uh, we're going to be having Mina Huang, uh, Principal Architect at Microsoft on for causal, causal Behavioral Modeling Framework, Discrete Choice Modeling of Consumer Demand. Um, we'd love to see you all there. I've posted, uh, I've po posted the, the link to the webinar in, in the chat as well as on YouTube. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Tom and Gaith, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank yeah, you, Nathan. Thanks like for to, everyone. We'd just like to ask everyone, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, if you would like to join our community, it's not a competitor to Data Science jo Dojo. It's a compliment. Um, we're a community of data scientists that just want to grow more together. Our mentoring fees are the most expensive on the planet and that we ask you to not pay us, but to pay it forward by helping other new people like we're doing with each other.